The Envelope is brought to you by Universal Pictures Oppenheimer, written and directed by Christopher Nolan, for your consideration. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Envelope. My name is Yvonne Villarreal, and I'm joined by my co-hosts Mark Olson and Sean Finney. We have a great episode. I mean, Mark, you talked to Greta Lee, who gave an amazing performance in Past Lives. And Sean, you had the great pleasure of talking to the costume designer of The Color Purple. I'm speaking of Francine Jameson Tanchak. Great. Yes. I'm so jealous. <laughs> How was that? It was amazing for so many different reasons. I mean, Francine has been on so many films. Glory, uh, Beast of a Nation, uh, Just Mercy, all these pieces that really capsulate periods of time. I love talking to her about her process because when I think of like films like that, I think about the world that is created around and what an actor needs to kind of really step into that space. And right. that's what her and the production designer and Blitz and everyone have created. But I also find it really interesting because she was one of the costume designers. Maybe that wasn't the title. She worked with the costume designer, Aggie Rogers, from the original Color Purple. Oh, wow. Right? So we had a lot of conversation around what that was like being on set then and then getting the call from Blitz to be on the set this time. And so it was a beautiful journey into her her understanding of really just her career, but also what this moment means to her and just like to culture in the community. Mm -hmm. But what about you, Mark? I know you spoke to Greta Wu's performance we all loved. So, so well, good. Well, I think what's exciting is that Greta Lee's an actor that we've you know, seen over the last few years. She was so terrific in Russian Doll. Mm -hmm. She's really good on The Morning Show. But those have been like supporting roles and with past lives, the way that she really steps up and like plays the lead in a, in a film. It's the debut feature for writer-director Sadine Song, who's been a playwright up to now, so it's not as if she's, you know, fully coming from nowhere. And for Greta, I think this is a role that draws on her own heritage as a Korean-American. I mean, she speaks in Korean in the film, which is something that she's said many times that she didn't necessarily think would ever happen, that she would do in a movie. So I think to see the way that she's kind of stepped up and then the, in the, her performance and then also the response that it's gotten ever since the film first premiered at Sundance has just been so warmly received. Greta, so far, has you know, got nominations from the Spirit Awards, the Gotham Awards, she got a Golden Globe nomination, that it's just been great to see the sort of like response that she's gotten when you see someone like take a chance and move forward in the way that she has. Well, and we benefit from seeing her on this press tour and just seeing the looks that she's delivering. Oh, Similar to the God. morning show. Like yeah. I watch the morning show, I love the morning show, but like also I'm like, where is she? Because she yeah. just comes in every time and kills it. Kills it, kills it. I'm so excited for this. We're gonna take a short break and when we come back, We'll have my conversation with Greta Lee. For the Los Angeles Times and The Envelope, I'm Mark Wilson. I'm here today with Greta Lee from the film Past Lives. Greta, thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having me here. And so the film is the debut from writer-director Celine Song. It's about a woman in New York, Nora, who reconnects with her childhood sweetheart from Korea, which causes some tension with her husband, her current husband there in New York. How, how was that? I always feel awkward. That like... was really good. I was going to say, it's one of the hardest things to say the log line, and often I find myself just Googling it <laughs> my own movie, and I thought that was really succinct and, and really well done. Recently, I've read a few things where people are almost debating whether to describe the movie as a romance mm -hmm. or if it's something else, this story of Nora sort of mourning and in some way rediscovering her own identity. I love this argument. How do you see it? When I think about my first encounter with this movie and reading this script, I had exactly that kind of conflict, I guess, of of how to categorize or how how to I how do I evaluate this movie? Um because yes, on the one hand, as I was reading, it's absolutely clear that it's a romantic drama and that there are certain tropes like um, a love triangle and a woman choosing you know, two men who represent two different lives and two different identities. And yet it is that thing that only Celine can do where she's able to take that idea and that genre, I guess, and make it feel, I mean, for me, I almost felt like it was science fiction. There's just this way where it does become so much more than just a, a romance. I mean. It has to be. I mean, at the things we were talking about, we were talking about the human condition and we were talking about all the choices that can make a life and 
even this idea of, you know, for someone uh, like Nora and, and maybe for anyone that the greatest romance could be the romance you have with your own life. I had an opportunity to talk to Celine Song and she said how she's been really struck by as the movie's been coming out, she feels like she's gotten to know the audience for the movie so well because people come up to her and share these really personal stories that are sort of similar, sometimes not. Like, have you had that same experience? It's been like a tangible experience that I am, am re-encountering the movie through our audience now. You know, whether it's at the supermarket, which it's like just like mid putting a cereal box into my cart and having someone say, oh, my gosh, I just saw your movie. And the things that have been revealed, I mean, it really sometimes it's a lot to receive. I mean, people, I think that is what's so signature about this movie is it really depending on where you are in your life, it seems to hit you in such a different way. Um, and just anecdotally from the the degree of like the variety and in, in, in response and I've had you know one of my favorite exchanges was was with a young person who said I saw your movie and I realized I've never been in love before and um, though I was devastated by the end of the movie I was so filled with hope for the day that I'll be, I'll be in love. And I just, I, I never even considered that uh, before. And then on the other hand, you know, people who have uh, revealed like, you know, I've been married for this long, but I'm thinking I need to really reconnect with this person from my past and what do I do? And, you know, I have no answers, you know. Uh, and then much older couples who've been married for several decades saying that the movie kind of reinvigorated and restored their their union and then you know the, the long walk that they took after seeing the movie so anyways it's just been it's been a really wide range of uh, of, of a response that i i do i love and, and appreciate you've kind of had this niche of these really sort of captivating intriguing supporting roles mm -hmm. and i've heard you say that you don't like the phrase scene stealer did i say that Hmm. Yes, I must have. Was it a conscious <laughs> thing for you that you you like you wanted a lead role? Like you you wanted as an actor, of course you want a lead role. I mean, if you the assumption is you like the job, and you the assumption is also then you want more of it. Um, and I think that it is it would be disingenuous of me not to talk about it in terms of opportunity. And representation and what that means to be actually be the center of your own story and to tell a story like this around someone who possibly looks like me even um, on my own terms and yes that it was absolutely something that I'd always dreamed of since I was a little girl when I first imagined like you know I was just a girl who was like oh, I want to be in the movies and in a lot of ways I'm exactly the same I'm still just that little girl who wants to be in movies. Yet, I think over the years, there is this voice that tells you, well, maybe that's not in the cards for you. Um, and and frankly, I think I had arrived at a place where I, I had made peace with that, in fact. I mean, I, I, I love these characters that I've gotten to play. Um, Maxine from Russian Doll, Stella Bach. Um, these are not small people to me. And then Celine came along with this script that just sort of ruined everything. <laughs> you auditioned for this role, and at first you did not get it. Mm -hmm. And as an actor, I assume you are used to a certain amount of rejection, mm -hmm. but this had to have felt different. It did. It hurt. It hurt a lot. Uh, it was so clear that this movie was special and it was so clear that this role would be life-changing for whoever got to take it on. I mean, it's not, um, I couldn't take for granted reading some like, something like this, a chance to, yes, use cultural specificity um, to then kind of take away the heavy lifting of having to explain yourself. Um, and instead getting to actually simply just like present a story about love, um, which is something I'd watched my peers get to do for 
decades. And so when it when it came back around, what did that what did that feel like? I think my journey with this movie and how I got to be involved, it kind of reflects sort of the core ideas of the movie itself, just to like Inyan and Destiny and and Soulmates, because I really felt like I had Inyan with the script when I first read it. And then for it to come back around in the way that it did almost exactly a full year later um, was really, I mean, it's its astounding to me even now. And getting that chance completely out of the blue to meet Celine, who I also now feel, you know, we have this union. We, we, we are almost certain we were married in another life. <laughs> and the way she says it, I'm not always sure that she means it completely in a positive way, that we were definitely married. But I really did find an actual creative partner. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's just, I think that those are all things that we were kind of pulling from in, in terms of um, the essence of Nora um, and the spirit of the movie that we were trying to make. Because I find it so striking that I've seen you say a couple times that you kind of never really expected to speak Korean in a role and then you get this part and then you're really self-conscious that like your Korean isn't Oh, yeah. Good enough? I think most people who are bilingual um, in America, it's just there. there is a level of self-consciousness and I will say like a shame of am I Korean enough? Have I assimilated too much? And it's very revealing to show your language. <laughs> After I got the movie and I realized just how much Korean I was going to have to speak, I was I was absolutely terrified about that in ways that it, it, it's, it is kind of difficult for me to explain. Um, I will say that it's sort of like the way that Nora is saying goodbye to her child self and a life that was never lived in Korea. I, the process of doing this movie in Korean, my first language, brought back a certain kind of reconciling my own identity that I had said goodbye to. But then you worked with Sharon Choi, who people know as mm -hmm. Bong Joon-ho's translator on the Parasite Press Tour, kind of as a consultant? Because of the movie we wanted to make and because ultimately we're talking about what it's like to almost pivot between two worlds. I mean, the seed of this movie is Celine's real experience where she found herself sitting at a bar between these two men who know her completely differently and what it's like to be at the threshold between them. And that requires something very hyper-specific um, in terms of the language too. I, I essentially was really scared that we were gonna find a conventional dialect coach who would kind of make me sound like a perfect Korean woman, which is something I wanted to be for a lot of my life. But I think that was the risk that we were making. If if that wouldn't work for the movie we were, we were trying to make, and I'm so glad that they were on board with this idea of working with Sharon. And someone like Sharon, the genius of Sharon, is she understands that language and all of this, it's so fluid and it's so much more than just the technical aspects of how you sound. Of course, there is a lot of that. But we worked for months in talking about the specifics of how you would sound based on how much time you had spent in one place versus the other, looking at a scene and figuring out, is there a way for Nora to sound very American at the beginning of the scene? And then maybe after hours of reconnecting with her Korean sweetheart, child and sweetheart, they, she would sound much more Korean again and how to, to find that in a very nerdy scientific way 
it just it was so gratifying. I'm uh, a bit of a DVD commentary nerd, mm -hmm. and on the commentary for past lives, you say something that I found really fascinating. You mentioned the Celine Song School of Radical Restraint. Can you describe that more clearly? Don't cry. <laughs> I think sometimes, and I'm I'm guilty of this too, when we think about great performance, um, there is this sort of subconscious, maybe assumption that you are sort of, you are meant to show that you understand what uh, is the assignment, as the kids like to say. Uh, um, this idea of like more is more, right? This movie is not that. And that was also one of the very apparent challenges of this movie right from the beginning. But it's also what made it so excellent mm -hmm. um, to read. I mean, that kind of restraint, especially in this moment where it seems like everything else is antithetical to this. I mean, we, we support so much more this idea of the loudest voice in the room. Our movies are getting bigger. Um, and Celine, for Celine to come in, this being her debut, and being so unapologetic and insistent on this kind of stillness and the value of the ordinary. I, it was, it was stunning. I mean, really, I feel really forever changed by her, that kind of courage that is just innate. Um, so what that meant on a technical level and on a practical level in terms of our acting, like this kind of, I guess what they call naturalism, it requires sitting on so much, which was something I'd never been asked to do before, to trust that the audience will still hopefully be invested, even if there's not a lot of emoting. Um, the way the script was written, there was always going to be a big emotional payoff happening at the end of the movie, which felt really risky of, you know, this idea, will, will they still be with us at the end? You know, if Nora isn't seen crying, bursting into tears, I think there's one scene where you do see her cry and I couldn't help but laugh because I realized she, Celine, and our incredible cinematographer, Xavier, they were shooting it from behind. <laughs> so this one moment when I thought, okay, you know, I can like really like let it rip was shot the back of my head um, when uh, Nora breaks up with his home. But I think that that is one of the core tenets of this movie, of um, that kind of... Um, truth of what it is. Because I want to ask you about, I, I think it's the scene you're talking about, the final scene in the movie. Nora walks her childhood sweetheart down the block, puts him in a cab, he goes away, she pauses, and then she just walks back to her apartment. And on the, it sounds so simple, but the scene just ha is so full of meaning and it is like the biggest action scene or something. Like there's so much happening in that yeah. scene. And I'm personally so haunted by the way the breeze catches your dress and sort of pulls you back. And the pulls the dress in his direction. Tell me about shooting that scene. Yeah, like, what, I love what was that about like? this last scene. Well, okay, so we, in a way, it did, it felt like we were shooting an action sequence. Like I, It felt like this is like, oh, our big Michael Bay moment um, because it, there were so many elements in place and it felt like just yeah, technically speaking, we shot it in one take. Um, uh, there is a dolly that tracked from the apartment to where the Uber comes and then back to the apartment again. And I love what Celine described to us then that even the direction of our walking and the camera, all of that was so intentional because Nora and his home are walking right to left towards their past. And then the wind blows also in that same direction towards the pass. Uh, and from there, they, Hezum leaves and Nora continues back left to right into her present. And then also Hezum drives away into th the future. 
I mean, that's just to say that there were so, it really was so surgical in the way, in the execution, but it is that kind of actor's dream and that they're all, there's this framework that's, that is so uh, 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 specific and really robust. And within that, there was so much that was left to, I want to say chance, because the wind was something that just happened in, in that moment. Um, and things like the timing of when exactly the car was going to come was not known before. Uh, Celine didn't know either. Um, and that's where, you know, her background in stage work, like, and, and even comedy, like that tension, like that's just what this is. Um, timing tension, trying to throw all of those elements together for that scene was, was really so challenging <laughs> and terrifying and so what so special just really one of the top moments professionally of, of my life really and what has it meant for you to have the movie get the kind of response that it's had i mean right from when it debuted at, at sundance it, it got a tremendous response there it's had a successful you know theatrical release it's been for incurring useful awards nominations. What what has that all been like? That's a thing. Like you can have an experience that feels so distinctly extraordinary and then also feel like the result, the the um the success of this movie feels like it's beyond your own comprehension. I I am so amazed. I I feel so proud of what we we made and it does feel a little bit like, I mean, and also in terms of the like recognition, um, we are in the company, we are an excellent company. And these are massive films by beloved filmmakers who we have loved for so long. And it it's absolutely surreal to have been on this ride with this movie that we, that was so personal. It is like, it's hard to even, <laughs> talk about like what this is and and our love for this kind of a movie to exist at all I think that was certainly something we were thinking about in making this like this with an excitement of can we pull this off a movie like this right now is there an audience for this and and just finding that there is I don't know I don't know if there's anything better than that do you feel like the movie has already had an impact for you personally or professionally, like, can you feel that something is different for you because of this movie? It's a strange thing for me to, off that part of it too, to wrap my mind around because I've been myself this whole time, you know? And so there are funny, you know, kind of like monikers, like a breakout or breakthrough, or, you know, but all these things happening now for me at this moment in my life is very, is wild. I mean, I, I'm 40 years old and to be a breakout is, is a very hilarious thing to me. Um, but also so neat. I had said goodbye to a certain kind of career that I thought I was never going to have. And now it looks like, it looks like I may, it looks like there's a, there's is a world where I will continue to be able to, yeah, I move in this direction. Um, be at the center of, of my own story, I guess. Um, and to keep being, I don't know, that girl who just wants to be in movies. I've heard you say a couple times, I'm not going back. And I'm so struck by the confidence of that. And, and <laughs> well, hearing it back now, it's like, who, oh, who said that? Oh, I said that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Does it feel that way to you? I mean, like that the, the sense that there was this career that you have had and that now there may be this other career you're hoping to have like that. I find that very striking. It's easiest for me to put it in the context of not just me, but other people. When I think about what it's meant to have this opportunity coming from a place where I'd accepted, I thought, you know, maybe I'll get one shot like this in my lifetime and it'll probably come towards the end of my career. Now, having had this experience, I know distinctly I do not want that for myself. 
And I don't want that for anyone else. I don't want that for any other woman or any other um, woman of color or anyone else who's been told maybe explicitly that, you know, they're, they're marginalized by this industry or they're powerless. I just, I don't want that. Um, now, what to do about that is an ongoing complicated question. But I think that, yeah, I have to be honest that my expectations are different that I'm that I'm going to be more demanding <laughs> of our of the people who um, are in power maybe um, I'm thinking a lot about stewardship and what it means to not just hold myself accountable but hold other people accountable um, and just thinking about as a result of having done this movie like how did that swing this door open for everyone else. Was there a, a moment when you feel like you became aware of the fact that TV shows, movies, like did not include people like you? Like, like when, when did that, so when did you sort of process that? I think that's just something that happens over and over and over again. Uh, you know, the first time I saw Annie, and as a little girl going to whatever school program and saying, so I would like to play Annie, please. <laughs> and being told kind of gently, well, probably not. Instances like that, um, were, that weren't, that collectively made it very clear um, that, you know, I am not, though I may perceive myself as Annie, that maybe the world around me at that time does not. But it's, finding ways, finding side doors, I guess. I recently had this memory of what it was like, for example, when I went to college and one of my first assignments uh, was to go to the student store and buy myself a box of stage makeup. There are these Ben Nye makeup kits. And when I got to the store uh, as an 18 year old kid, uh, I discovered that there were only three kinds of boxes. There's a black box, a uh, Latino box and a Caucasian box. Uh, and I remember I was in the store for a while trying to figure out, like, I had to buy a box for class. Um, and, and it's, I think for me, remarkable and important for me to remember personally that that kid didn't sort of burst into tears or feel like a victim of her own circumstance. The kid that I was really sprang into action and and was trying to make certain calculations like, okay, well, I'm like a sort of tan Asian. So is there a way I could combine the Latin box with a Latino box with maybe the black box? And, and which in retrospect, I think is absolutely heartbreaking to know that that's what was happening. But I'm so grateful that that girl then, even upon discovering that her dream literally did not exist anywhere on those shelves, just decided, well, I'm going to make my own path. Um, and sometimes it's those paths, yeah, that don't exist, that didn't exist previously, um, that can end up um, to something great. How often do people ask you to do the sweet birthday baby line <laughs> from Russian Doll, and do you do it? I don't do it. <laughs> I don't do it. Uh, I have already gotten that line out of my system. There's the assumption that, you know, maybe I, I said that line once or twice and they kind of reused it. Every time you hear me say sweet birthday baby on the show, I mean, I, that is maybe take however. I mean, when you do the math, that's a lot of time. Yeah. That's enough time for, for any living person to say that phrase. But I, So I appreciate, you know, the interest in, in, in people still wanting to hear me say that, but I respectfully decline those requests. And now this recent season on The Morning Show, your character became much more central to the story. And is that something that you ex expect? Like, did they tell you that ahead of time? I, or did they make me more central to the to, to, Or do to, the scripts just come in and you're like, whoa. We had a different set of writers. Um, Charlotte Stoud uh, came in for the third season. We had Carrie Aaron the season before. 
Um, we work with a really excellent team of people who are managing a behemoth of a show with multiple storylines. Um, and I, I, I could appreciate in reading the scripts, like, okay, yeah, they're, they are really digging into what it's like for a woman like Stella to navigate all of these very dynamic pieces of power, her youth coming in as an outsider, um, these moral dilemmas of uh, her own personal beliefs versus what would make for an effective boss or businesswoman, all these very interesting ideas. And I could see that they were developing them. Um, I don't know. I, I, I like to think that maybe it's because I, they thought I did a good job the season before. Um, and, and also just that group, that, that it is such a fun gig. Those are really, <laughs> you may be shocked to hear this, really excellent actors <laughs> who, but who really genuinely care about the craft, about what we're doing that day, that it feels like theater school, um, which I think is rare and it is something you know that I absolutely treasure when I find it. And uh, you were uh, recently named by the New York Times as one of the most stylish people of 2023. And I have to say, I'm always so taken by like red carpet photographs of you. Like I, I am curious, the word I guess I would use is fashion forward, or I, I don't know if you uh, how you think of it. But what is it that you that you like about red carpet dressing and and uh, about dressing that way? I always find it so surprising when people are are mention the like my red carpet stuff. I mean, it's sort of like what we're talking about in terms of this moment for me. Um, having been spent some time in the business and you know being at the age that I am. I think the red carpet is also this like, funny extension of just trying to answer the question of like, who am I now? <laughs> like you're happening, you, you happen to get me now. So who is this person and how can I, I think I genuinely find that challenge thrilling is what I'm saying of how can I present myself and you know, certainly the best version of myself. On, on any certain, uh, on these days, these sort of big, big events. But how can I do it in a way that sort of preserves some part of myself mm -hmm. uh, in a way that I can get on board with? Uh, because the red carpet has become its own, not to get too boring about this, but like industrial complex mm -hmm. and its own projections about all sorts of ideas about what a person should be, what a woman should be. And I'm sort of, enjoying the dance that I'm doing of of wondering well what's my what's my answer to that how can I step forth um with joy and celebrate this moment while also yeah holding on to something that feels true and personal again it's surprising to me every time because they're I'm trying to hold on to a certain weirdness frankly um I I think people these days are just less weird and less, I, there's less humor. There's less of a sense of of this playfulness that I, I really feel nostalgic for. And everyone does. Everyone looks so good. Everyone looks flawless. But to me, I just don't find that as interesting, genuinely. Uh, so yes. So every time someone says that they liked something that I wore, it it does it does mean something to me. Greta, thank you so much for joining us today. I, uh, I'm going to try to hold on to some weirdness going out yeah. into the world. <laughs> Thanks for having me. This is so nice. Thanks. Coming up next, Sean's conversation with Francine Jamison Tanchuk. Welcome back to The Envelope. My name is Sean Finney, and I'm looking forward to today's conversation from one of my favorite films this season, and I think one of the most anticipated films of the season. I'm with costume designer Francine Jamison Tanchuk from The Color Purple. Hello, Francine. Thank you for joining us. Hello. How, How are, are you, you feeling? I'm, I'm feeling very honored, very, really excited about the uh, how the color purple is being received. And it, it, it just makes me smile a lot. Here we are in 2023 and we're watching the color purple 
again. I think a story that impactful can have many different lives. Oh, yeah. And especially with the impact and contributions from individuals like yourself. And <laughs> oh, I want to just run you. down because you've had you've had an amazing career and will continue to still have an amazing career. But some <laughs> of the films, Glory, um, Birth of a Nation, Emancipation, They Clone Tyrone, The Color Purple. There's so many, Just Mercy, I believe, as well. Yeah. So many there. And like, so I always like to do first. I want to get into all things color purple from script to set, but <laughs> I, I do think it's important because I think what we do is a lot of illuminated by who we are in like early beginnings. So I want to take it back just a little bit, just okay. a little bit. All righty. Because um, I know when you were about seven or eight years old that, you know, you really kind of started playing in the space of like costume design with your dogs. Yes. So walk me through a little bit of that. I'm curious how that kind of started. My mother was very much a, a seamstress, uh, although her profession was a surgical nurse but she loved the crafts and she really loved to sew. And she taught me how to sew. She taught me how to do hand stitching and hand embroidery, and all these different things. And I was only seven when I learned that. And, wow. and she would not really want me to do, uh, go on the machines because you know, the machine was a little bit different. And so she just was uh, concerned about my safety, but eventually I did, and I was just kind of we were sneaking in, really did it on my own and figured it <laughs> out. And I was about nine when I was in, ended up just stitching my own the doll clothes first, and then my some cousins I had doing their clothing and doing my own and having buy and match the dolls, and it was really kind of interesting, you know, how that all that started. And you love cinema and film. It's like, yes. you know, when did you start to kind of understand oh my the gosh. power Old of movies. collaborating those together? I thought, just looking and, and viewing the costumes. I remember uh, just many years ago when they, when a lot of films were coming out of the theater and were, and were on television, because uh, some things I don't think my parents wanted me to see certain <laughs> things like Carmen Jones, or and I couldn't do anyway because I was probably wasn't even born when that came out. But at the same time, when it it aired on on television, <laughs> I just thought, wow, Dorothy Dandridge. Look at these beautiful African American women. Look at these beautiful black women and how sexy they are in the clothing. And in that era, and I think it was probably in the 40s or something, and I thought, wow, it's so beautiful. And, and then on another uh, film I loved was Sayonara. Mm -hmm. It was the costumes on, on the culture of, of the, the uh, Japanese people were thought oh my beautiful and they tell a story of their own right? they really do the costumes really help I think the actors and and really the crew and everyone yeah. kind of immerse themselves into the character I'm curious like when did access and opportunity like what talk me to like when the programs the early programs you started and how you started to see this as a path for a career you know, earlier, I thought I wanted to be a surgical nurse because my mother was. I was so proud of my mom because she was part of saving lives and helping people, and I thought that maybe that's the way I would like to go. But I just had such support in my family and, and really from my mother, Elijah, you really should be in the arts, Francine. I, I don't think the medical profession is, is where you should end up. <laughs> and because I thought, I, okay, I decided to work as a junior volunteer or candy striper or something when I was a teenager. And, and I thought, how can I be a nurse when I can't even deal with a sight of blood or people <laughs> bleeding? You know, and that, that's not going to work. So I decided, yes, I, I went on to a college called Mount San Antonio College, which was wonderful with a program in fashion, merchandising and design. I received my AA and I was on my way to UCLA. I, wanted, I had my SATs and all the things I was preparing to continue for my BA. And I had the opportunity of a lifetime, an apprenticeship program that was starting in the film industry for affirmative action was in, involved at those days. And I decided to apply. I, would, I thought I would never, ever get it. So I continued to think about continuing on with my education. Lo and behold, it came through. Out of almost 500 applicants, two of us went in that particular year. Wow. 
And when I thought, this is meant to be. The things that connect us through, whether it's the journey of film, through your discography, but also your filmography, but also just like glory, right? And you getting to that space, having gone through what you had learned and immersed yourself in yes. that time. And then getting into it and kind of, I think, really being like, well, can she, will she? And you right. saying, watch me. And to me, sounds so powerful for so many things. Yeah. Um, what does that mean when you're like, you know, watch me? And how do you think you've kind of carried that energy of that throughout your career so far? Glory really catapulted me into the designer's guild. And it was a movie that some thought that a woman doing a Civil War film a young woman doing a Civil War film? A young African-American woman doing a Civil War <laughs> film? How's this going to work? <laughs> but Ed Zawick and, and Peter Jan Brugge, two of the ones that, why not? And Ed Zawick was the one that said, women were at home, they were uh, sewing the, the uniforms for their husbands and sons, and they had to deal with taking care of the homestead while a lot of them went to war. And even some of the women disguised themselves going to war. So wow. women were a very, very instrumental in, in carrying on when a lot of things kind of almost collapsing during, the, during that war. Yeah. So they were very open to it. And Ed Zawick thought, why not you know, a, a different perspective from a woman's point of view on doing this particular film. Oh. And that we, that there we go. And that's when I said to myself, watch me. As we start to segue into The Color Purple, what I love about this is not your first rodeo at The Color Purple. You worked with the legend herself, Miss Aggie Rogers. Miss Aggie, who's a, just a joy. Tell me Absolute about that experience, joy. you know, from working on the original Color Purple. Well, my particular job at that, at that time, there were two supervisors on a film, a supervisor for the women, one for the men. Don Vargas was the uh, supervisor for the men's costumes. But Aggie and I just jailed so much together and she knew my love for period and, and those types of vintage outfits. And so she really wanted me to go through the costume houses and just search for different things, not only just for the, the women, to see what if I came across other things for the men's costumes as well. And she utilized me for uh, doing swatching fabrics and uh, just working with her in fittings. It, it was such a wonderful collaboration with, with Miss Aggie. So my inspiration from her just carried into working on the, uh, the Color Purple 2023 just remembering I had so much fun and the fondness that I had for that particular movie, that particular production. And when you think about, again, with that film, the impact that that film has had, the responsibility to oh. it. I'm so, I'm so curious how once you started to, okay, now the, you've like, okay, I'm gonna do, do it. it. I'm actually gonna do, do it. it. Okay, Take come on, well, you know, having the divine presence, <laughs> you've gotta come with me on this, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> I need something outside of myself, exactly, in addition to myself. in addition. <laughs> yes, to bring this together. <laughs> Bigger than me. <laughs> yes, and like doing that, and I mean, in a film taking place in the early 1900s, you know, <sighs> going into the deep south, the stories that that tells, but also yes. in Africa. Let's just start with like, the process. I'm curious, like, where do you start with the sourcing and the process? Of well, for history? how I like to start, of course, is totally collaborating with the director and coming on board of his vision. Where are you headed for this? And, and Blitz had a really distinct, uh, um, he was envisioning how this color purple was going to evolve and and I love the idea this guy is so talented with his art and he has he just really can see it in his mind and I've been able to have that as well with costumes I can see the costume already built how it can be shot how it's worn even before it's you know made yeah. before anything else go you know it's on paper or sketched or patterns or anything I can already see it built in my mind and I, I felt that with Blitz and support and with that going on, I like doing what is called mood boards, costume mood boards. Oh yeah, let's talk about it. That give us the mood and feel of every character. And I made, created them for every last character. Starting of course with Seeley, young Seeley and young Nettie 
and Seely in this particular age and Suge and every last one of them had what was called a mood board and and I was really sharing that all the time, dropping them in the drop boxes, as Blitz <laughs> says, let's drop it in the drop box. <laughs> and everyone could see it was so production design and, and cinematography and makeup and hair and all of us that, that really were trying to create this world and, and the characters. And because we were so uh, unified, I think, that all the department heads on this film, when every, anyone had wonderful research that he came across, they would share it we would share each other and it, it, it just just evolved into a, a wonderful kind of a family effort. I love One, that. It, 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 it just had to, we had to be unified, I think. When I look at it, I think about obviously Suge, uh, played by the wonderful Taraji P. Oh, Henson. Yes. I think about Fantasia. I yes. think about Daddy. I think about all of them. And then I think about like, the dancers, right? Because that's a whole other, <laughs> what is that process? Because I imagine their wow. costumes are different because they have to move and bend and be able yes. to, to stretch and expand. Like, walk me through. They cannot of... be uh, inhibited with the costume or constricted in any way. And a lot of those, too, the wonderful Fatima Robinson and her beautiful choreography, she was able to send me videos on what the dance would look as though. And, and I could really uh, just visit the rehearsals and see how they were moving. and. Taraji says, I'm doing my own dance. And then she says, I, I don't need a, a dance double. I'm doing in the, you know, the whole thing. And of course, because they are all dancers and uh, Taraji, Fantasia, Sophia, Court, they come out of theater. So, I mean, in theater, you do everything. You're like a triple threat. Everything had to be built, all of these costumes and, and in building them for the dancers, you incorporate movement into some things that had to have the stretch, like certain gussets that were the same colors as the trousers on the, on the guys, vintage clothing that we had to purchase and then go through and rework it so it can work for the dancers as well. But, and, and Taraji's outfits the pushed the and button. Oh my goodness. When she arrived, Blitz and I said, she has to have that moment. When she's coming on that barge and I said, Blitz, no color does that like red. Yeah, yeah. It, it's gotta be red. Yeah, and it pops it, and it has its own statement. The color it, red has its own statement. Yes, indeed. And, and, and to reuse the red statement for Seeley, mm -hmm for Miss Seeley's pants. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think we wanted to carry that through, that this was that strong color that's made, uh, you know, that says something, that says a statement, and it had to really just pop. And when Suge arrived at the juke, she threw off that cocoon coat. <laughs> she was ready for the show. I mean, there were a few moments like that, even, even um, you know, Fantasia's character when she arrived because that was the first time we really got to see, see her dressed right. up and like those she moments. descends the stairs and even mister had to yeah oh wow he had it, it took him aback a bit so it it was just a wonderful moment for uh for fantasia as well because after wearing all these little cotton dresses yes. and going through the moment because blitz all was really kind of taking her on this journey yeah sticking to the the script itself you know the the continuity yeah so by the time that she was wearing the juke joint outfit that suge had had given to her fantasia says oh i get to dress yeah. up today yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and you see how that fits even in the film like how the costumes really help elevate but also just as I imagine for the actors, uh -huh. you, know, you have a unique perspective of watching them transform into. Yes. Um, tell me about that process. Cause I mean, they're already coming with their chops and, and able to perform, but I feel right. like the, the costumes and the world that is created with production design and makeup and hair really kind of help immerse it. I'm curious from your perspective. Really introducing them to and, and showing them the mood boards and having that in the fittings. And we were uh, talking about how their character was going to travel through time and they just trust me you know, they were really so open to 
trust me on the decisions, trust Blitz on, on what our vision was for the, the colors and the colors being used. And sometimes we would think, oh, maybe that's not it, or, and Dan uh, Lawson's cinematography, yeah. and really conferring with him on what this particular process he's using and uh, the production designer, Paul Osterberry. It was, it, it was really just, like I said, a, a collaborative unity of all of us working together for this particular vision. One of the standout characters, there's so many, the entire cast, um, Miss Sophia. <gasps> Miss, Miss Sophia. Sophia. She was, I'm not taking no mess. I know who I am. <laughs> I'm not doing what y'all are doing. But even how that was reflected in her costumes. And well, Blitz and I wanted to have Sophia's costumes to still to be kind of a girly, a woman, because Sophia loved that. She loved being, uh, she loved Harpo. She liked being a wife to him. She loved being a mother, sister, and all of that. So her costumes didn't have to come across in a way that reflected her strength because mm -hmm. she knew who she was anyway. Mm -hmm. So it was great to because you know, they were still in this little rural country town in the South in this era. So everything had to kind of reflect that. Of course. And, and they were getting their cottons and, and uh, fabrics from the general store. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to show those little calico cottons or those little the things that were of that era and I wanted to keep it that, you know, in that vein, in, in that particular world. I'm curious because when I think of um, Suge's number, you know, um, at the bar, how <laughs> many sets of these costumes? Three. Wow. There were, well, there were, let's see, three or four? Three for Miss uh, Suge herself. One for the double in case we needed yep. to do the dance yep. double, who never really did yeah. perform. <laughs> Suge did all of her dancing. So it was, I would say, four in all. Wow. Because let's face it, I mean, that fringe, that was bead Be and, and yeah. sequin. And if anything snagged or whatever on tables or, you know, with her moving. Yeah. Ah. Uh, we have to have bring a quick in remedy. The, yeah, yeah, bring, bring, in, bring in, number two. in the number two. <laughs> wow. And, and so when you're building the arc of characters, I guess it depends on obviously this one being a musical, gives that context that there is going to be a lot of movement. Right. But is it common to have two or three different sets? Oh, yes, especially okay. for your principal actors. You know, wow. you have to because time is money yeah, and, and trying to take the time to rebuild a principal costume. No, no, no. You, you really have to go for multiples. So. Wow. I mean, this is honestly, I am so, <laughs> from a personal perspective, like from the community, again, I just have to say that like, this film has meant so much. And I'm oh, so Sean. proud that you I were am. able to harness the energy from the first and then bring your own element. And, and, yeah. and we love Miss Aggie Rogers and so yes, excited to see you <laughs> step into the space. I am so moved by this film. Thank and I you, hope that Sean. you know that your contribution to this film not only painted, but created the world for the audience to enjoy. And I just Thank you so I hope much. that you know that. Thank you, Sean. Thanks for watching The Envelope. We're gonna be taking our own holiday break, but we'll be back with another episode on January 11th with more conversations with some of your favorite talent. <laughs>